Good morning. My name is Jared Hammond, and I am the chair of the worship arts team here at East Shore Unitarian Universalist Church in Kirtland, Ohio. Thank you all for joining us here today, Beneath the Beacon and on Facebook Live. Whether you are a member or friend of our congregation, whether you join us every Sunday or only occasionally, whether we've known you for decades or you've just met us for the first time today, whether you are with us here under the beacon or if you join us from your own sacred space, you are welcome here. Acknowledging your skin color, ancestry, and expressions of gender, your net worth, political opinions, and the people you love, and the long, winding journey that brought you here this morning, you are welcome. May this be a time of reflection and renewal, a time to live into our mission to love, revere, discover, and connect. As a reminder, because of ongoing issues with the pandemic, we are asking for no congregational singing, but we do invite you to open your hymnals uh, for the opening hymn and read along with the choir as they sing. The one that is the number is written there that I can't remember at the moment. <laughs> I got my space helmet on, we're good to go. Uh, I would like to offer my own welcome as well this morning. I'm Reverend Joe Donatone, and it is, as always, an honor to serve you uh, this morning. The words for our chalice lighting come from Kathy Cartwright Chow, and these have been adapted just slightly. But I ask you to think of these words as we light our flame. For those we have hurt in any way, whether through words or deed or thoughts, here is a place to forgive and be forgiven. For those excuses we have made just to be right, for the blame we have placed on someone else again and again, 
for passing up the opportunity to help because we were afraid for finding the truth, for hiding the truth from someone, for working beyond anger and resentment, for the times we have not felt heard. Forgiveness is never easy, whether for yourself or someone else. Here is a place to forgive and be forgiven. Come, friends, let us gather together in the light of this chalice, the light of mystery, of hope, the light of peace. Together, let us explore that which has meaning. Together, let us find that which has worth in our lives. Together, let us worship. At the center of our worship and the center of our physical space, we place a bowl of stones. And I'd like to ask you to hold on to yours now if you have one, whether you grabbed it from the bowl at the top of the aisle or brought it in with you this morning, or if you'd like to grab one right now, now would be a great time to do that. I'd ask, I invite you to hold on to this stone as we read from this book where we place our joys and cares. Although sometimes we don't have any that we'd like to say out loud, and so we don't write them down. And that is the case today. So whatever the joys that you have, the milestones of your lives, the things that bring you peace and excitement, whatever struggles you may have or that you may know of those around you, as we hold them in our hearts, as we hold this stone in our hands, let us take a moment of silence to recognize those things, and if not out loud, to share them in the silent space. placing these stones in the bowl at the center of the institution. So our reading today 
uh, was written by Elizabeth Parbov, and it's called A Penitent's Prayer. It is an hour before sunrise, the waves keep coming, but each minute they make less progress than the minute before. As the tide goes out, the beach is exposed, a million pebbles visible in the lifting of night, a periwinkle clinging to a rock, a horseshoe crab scrambling to catch the receding ocean, and I am exposed in all my hurts and frailties. My composure drains away with the tide, and the disheveled beach mirrors the ragged edges of my soul. The whole bay is my confessional, the breath of dawn my confessor. I have been so consumed with my own hurts that I've forgotten to call a friend whose hurt is equal to my own. I put off doing those things that might bring healing to someone who is broken, or joy to someone who is sad, or compassion to someone who is at odds with the rhythm of life because I cared more for my own loneliness. I refused the hand of one who reached out to me, clinging instead to the old familiar ways. I chose to remain stuck inside a problem rather than ask for help to solve it. I pray that some benevolent spirit has listened to my heart's despair and judged me not. At the edge of the clouds, a rim of cream appears. Night creeps away with my guilt beneath its cloak. Dawn sprinkles absolution. The earth has kept its promise. Forgiveness is at hand. It's fun to get new, used to a new space. There we go. So, it's no secret that I was raised Catholic. Though I left many of those beliefs behind long ago, and now consider myself fully and truly Unitarian Universalist, bits of Catholicism survived that transition. One of those bits is St. Francis of Assisi. I deeply admire St. Francis of Assisi. And the reason I wanted to speak about him today is tomorrow is his feast day, where the entire Catholic Church will be celebrating the life and gifts of St. Francis. And it's hard not to love St. Francis. He's the patron saint of quite a few of my favorite things. Animals, ecology, family, peace, and needleworkers. Some of you 
Many of you probably don't know that I'm a big crocheter. Right? Yeah, crafty. Um, but then also, St. Francis' theology lifts up love the way our universalist ancestors did. St. Francis asks us to set aside the obsession with sin found in many interpretations of salvation. Instead, he focuses on the Christian God's powerful act of love at the root of salvation. So I carry St. Francis with me today into my life as a Unitarian Universalist. I'm going to read something to you, and I ask you to, to reflect on these words. They'll probably be pretty familiar to most of you. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is offense, let me bring pardon. Where there is discord, let me bring union. Where there is error, let me bring truth. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring your light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. Lord, let me not seek as much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that one receives. It is in self-forgiving, self-forgetting that one finds. It is in pardoning that one is pardoned. It is in dying that one is raised to eternal life. Now, some of you may know this as the peace prayer, or if you're in 12-step recovery, this is sometimes called the 11-step prayer, and a good many of you may simply recognize it as the prayer of St. Francis. That where there is discord, let me bring union. To not seek as much to be understood as to understand. However, St. Francis, unfortunately, did not write this beloved poem. Though it resonates deeply with his theology, the actual author is unknown. A French Roman Catholic magazine first published this prayer in 1912, long after St. Francis walked the earth. Where there is offense, let me bring pardon. It is in pardoning that one is pardoned, or in another translation, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. The prayer is, was wildly popular, and many parishes distributed it on the back of a card, the prayer on one side, and a photo of, or a picture rather, of St. Francis on the other, and the rest is history. But is it? Do these decidedly Christian sentiments, St. Francis, love, salvation, do they belong in a Unitarian Universalist church? Or should they be left in the past? Now, I don't know about you, but with this pandemic, with the recent news of the dire situation of the climate crisis, with the recent attacks on women's reproductive rights, I could sure use a little peace right now. I see an unfortunate truth emerging. As we look ahead over the next few months or years, a deep and ugly canyon cracks our social landscape in two, half of us on one side and most of our neighbors on the other. Several recent news articles explored how we got so divided. Some suggest political solutions that we might use to stitch the nation back together. I don't think these articles have got it quite right. I don't think politics are the root of the problem, so politics won't be the magic solution. I see in these articles and I hear in the public discourse a lot of we-they language. It's easy, friends, to forget that ultimately 
there is only we. Unitarian Universalism teaches us that we are all recipients of infinite universal love. Our principles remind us that every person has inherent worth and that every being is linked together in an interdependent web of existence. They and them are words that don't work in this construct. There is only we. We are struggling through a pandemic of truly historic proportions, and we are dying. We are facing a climate crisis, and we are so unsure of the future. We need our community's support now more than ever, and we have often forgotten how to talk to our neighbors. The trauma of this pandemic and the added stress of such bad climate news, these things are universal. How in the world are we going to fix this? I think the answer to the question isn't out there. I think instead it's in here, in our hearts. So maybe the resonance of St. Francis calling out a message of love and selflessness in a hundred-year-old Christian poem does have some use for us today. Line by line, the prayer asks us to look beyond ourselves. How can we begin to affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person if we refuse to see the humanity of the one with whom we disagree? How do we respect the interdependent web of life, of which we are all a part, no exceptions, when our hurt continues to push away large groups of people, making them other from ourselves? Unity informs so much of our justice work when it comes to women, LGBTQ people, and all of the instances of racial oppression, we know we can only solve these problems with a deep and abiding understanding. There cannot be in-groups or out-groups. We are all one human community. That's at the center of all of our justice work. The human struggle, just in general, is to make it from birth to death and to experience a little joy and love along the way. If for no other reason, we, all of us, are unified in that human struggle. So these divisions, they're not going to heal themselves, but where do we begin? And I suggest we start with forgiveness. And I think St. Francis would agree. Now, I want to give a caveat here. I don't mean to imply that our pain, our wounds, our scars don't matter or shouldn't matter. Our pain, our wounds, and our scars do matter. In many ways, they make us who we are. Our wounds reveal to us where we are tender. They bring out the ways we are strong, and they help us to bind together more tightly in community. The forgiveness I'm talking about is much less about the one we forgive than the one doing the forgiving. Now, I mentioned this prayer also shows up in 12-step recovery. In these programs, we work too hard to let go of our resentments. And resentments are these toxic points of anger, frustration, contempt, disgust. And they can bubble away under the surface. Resentments keep us in a state of trauma, holding tight to the pain, defining us by our wounds. Now sometimes, often, we find ourselves as the culprit in a broken relationship, and we try to go out and make amends. When making an amends, we aren't asking to be forgiven. It's not the point. 
we also aren't going out there to give that other person the opportunity to share how they also have been a terrible person in this relationship. That's not how it works. Our focus is on our own part in these relationships. We make amends to release ourselves from those toxic stuck points that keep us from moving on. And why hold on to these resentments anyways? What purpose do they serve? Between the pandemic and the climate crisis, families mourning losses, parents jobless for months, fearing for their hungry children, we are all still in crisis. Continuing to harbor resentment towards those we believe are to blame wastes precious energy. And I know I have no energy to waste right now. So as a Unitarian Universalist who finds a lot of meaning in the Christian tradition, I find comfort and examples of living through love in the Gospels. Now my favorite is the Gospel of Luke, and in there we find a very familiar story, the parable of the prodigal son. Now you don't have to be Christian to have heard this story, it's pretty popular throughout most of Western culture. Luke, in this gospel, is quoting Jesus, who's telling a story. And Jesus tells it something like this. A wealthy farmer has two sons. Upon reaching adulthood, the younger son asks for his inheritance and then goes out into the world. While he's out there, he never bothers to send a message back home. He cuts off communication completely. And out in the world, he also proceeds to squander his inheritance. Now, penniless, he takes odd jobs as a field laborer, and he's miserable. One day he remembers, oh, hey, my dad, he's a wealthy farmer, so maybe I can go back. Maybe he won't take me back and restore me as his son, but maybe he can at least give me a job. So the son returns home, and when he returns home, the father welcomes him with open arms, and restores the son's place in the family. Now this midpoint is where most people trail off. It's a good story, it's a happy ending, forgiveness, all done. But there's a second half to this story. Remember, there were two sons. The older son, who stayed at home and remained dutiful to his father, observes this very warm welcome and refuses to join the family in celebrating the younger son's return. The farmer goes to him and asks why the younger son is upset, or the older son is upset, and he lays it all out. He says, the older son says, that son of yours goes out into the world and wastes all your money on worldly things, come back and you welcome him home in celebration with the slaughtering of a fatted calf. Meanwhile, I have remained at your side. I've done the stand-up thing as your son, and we've never celebrated my life with anything as much as a little baby goat. It's not fair. So to which... The father replies, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. That's the important part. That's the important half. It didn't matter that the farmer's younger son had been what he'd been doing out there in the world. It didn't matter that he had lived his life with values the rest of the family didn't share. And there's a subtle and brilliant thing Jesus does with his word choice. In the text, the older brother refers to his brother as that son of yours. The word choice creates distance between himself and his brother, and now between himself and his father with whom he disagrees. The dad picks up the ball and lobs it right back. When he responds, he says, this brother of yours, putting the two brothers back together. The father doesn't care about the disagreement on values. His joy is in his family's reunification. Here, in this story, forgiveness serves a higher purpose. 
that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony. Now, I realize that this is probably not your cup of tea for some of you here in the room. Maybe you don't quite feel ready for forgiveness. And no amount of Christian scripture is going to change that. I get it. Let's explore this from another tradition. Buddhist monk Ken Isaro Bhikkhu suggests the following. Forgiveness and karma are linked. Bad karma is called vera. Forgiveness cannot undo old bad karma, but it can prevent new bad karma from being done. This particular instance of vera takes the form of vengeful animosity that wants to get back at someone for perceived wrongs. It manifests as hostility, hatred, and antagonism. The Dhammapada, a famous collection of early Buddhist poems, cautions of vara when someone has injured you and you'd like to inflict some injury back. It becomes a sort of feedback loop of negativity, and forgiveness is the only way to short-circuit that loop. So even if we are in the right, even if society allows us to settle the score, in this karma equation, we shouldn't. By forgiving the other side, we ensure that we won't accumulate any more vera for ourselves. This mud fight may have been going on for lifetimes, and the only thing we can be sure of is that forgiveness is our opportunity to end it once and for all. If we don't forgive, the ending may never come. Now another Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, who many of you will know, gives us the example of two arrows. The first arrow strikes us and causes pain. The second arrow, hitting the exact same spot, causes ten times as much pain. That second arrow is our reaction to the first arrow. Now, we cannot control anything in this world but ourselves. We can't preemptively stop the arrows that are going to hit us, but we can control how we respond. Do we want to magnify our pain with that second arrow? Perhaps instead we forgive. Now, friends, we Unitarian Universalists are uniquely suited to shaping this next chapter. We know how to bring our whole selves to the table, and we know how to invite everyone to that same table. And we have always had a clear vision of the future, and that vision has always been one filled with harmony and love. That's who we are. And Lord knows we are not perfect when we have failed to live up to our high standards. We learned how we learned our own place in the discord. We learned how to admit our shortcomings so that we can continue to strive for equitable resolutions. We're the people who show up and we own our part in it. And as we have done again and again and again in our history in Selma with women's reproductive rights alongside our LGBTQ siblings, and in defense of our Mother Earth, we must again take the high road. We must take a note from St. Francis and model a love-informed way forward. Because we believe, we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Because we affirm the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. Because it is up to us to begin to build the bridge across that canyon I mentioned earlier. Because if it doesn't start with us, it may not happen at all. And I believe that bridge cannot be built without a mighty portion of forgiveness. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. May it be so. Amen.
I feel comfortable suggesting that we all would like to be instruments for peace. And that's why we give from in here, from our time, from our efforts, and from our extra financial, financial resources. We give so that those of us who need also have what we have. And so I invite you to give as generously as you can as the baskets are passed around. Unless if you're a guest here with us this morning. We're very excited that you're here. And please, let the collection basket pass you as our guest. Please sign up. Uh, there should be a sign-up sheet in the narthex to sign up for that. Dinner will be small salad bar, zucchini bread, corn chips, uh, chili, the meat being turkey, and a soup, it being a vegetarian option. Uh, then please remember to take home your cyanotype if you've not already done so. Um, and then Next Sunday after the service will be the Great Calendar event. So if you have 
an event that needs to be put on the calendar for a committee of some kind or a small group, or if you have a really great idea of ways that we can connect over this next year, please come to that and make sure that it gets on the calendar so that we can all show up to everything that we want to. Now I invite you to stand and join hands if you feel comfortable doing so as we recite our bond of union. We join hands in unitary, universalist fellowship, pledging ourselves to an individual religious freedom which transcends all creeds, not to think alike, but to journey together. So I appreciate your flexibility as we make this little adjustment in the order of service. Um, as I mentioned last week, um, I don't like to light the chalice without extinguishing the chalice, as it is the container in which our worship lives. So as we extinguish the chalice, I'm going to borrow some words from a gentleman named Rolf Gerhardt. We extinguish this flame, a mere wisp of matter in process, almost as insubstantial as the thought of it. Yet our civilization has harnessed the power of such a flame to drive and shape a new world. So may it be with the power of our thoughts that in truth and love they may drive and shape a new world. Friends, go in peace. Bye, Internet friends.